West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Today is a deadline for more than 30 social media and telecom companies to respond to the select committee's request to preserve phone records and other materials related to January 6th. And as we've learned this month, one of the 12 known targets of those requests is the feckless minority leader of the House, the House GOP, that would be Lil Kevin McCarthy. Despite being in touch with Donald Trump during the insurrection, Lil Kevin made the dubious statement last week that he doesn't have anything to add to the investigation. And he falsely claimed that Trump had nothing to do with the mob that Trump summoned to Washington to, quote, stop the steal that day. There's nothing I have that can add to that day. Why Isn't there is another the question? FBI? Another question that the Democrats want to know is how deeply was the president involved? Well, with you know what what's interesting that about that? That's right? where law enforcement goes. Right? The FBI has investigated this. The Senate mm-hmm. had bipartisan committees and come back. And you know what they have found? That there is no involvement. Nope, nope. Of course, neither the FBI nor the Senate reached any such conclusion. Meanwhile, law enforcement is preparing for the so-called Justice for J6 rally on September 18th. That's a protest in support of the jailed insurrectionists who attempted to overthrow our government. That rally is being organized by a former Trump campaign official. And while the permit for the event claims that only 700 participants are expected to attend, nobody really knows how many might turn up nor how deranged they might be. Here's how Speaker Nancy Pelosi bluntly described them yesterday. Now these people are coming back to praise the people who were out to kill. Law enforcement is now planning to reinstall the protective fencing around the Capitol. And Roll Call reports that according to police intelligence, there's been an uptick in violent talk about the rally online. Extremists have discussed committing violent acts against local Jewish centers and liberal churches while law enforcement is distracted. And one user said, quote, I will be there with my AR-15, even though legally I can't have one. Notably, many Republicans who've been outspoken in their defense of the insurrectionists are are not planning to attend, including sedition cheerleaders Margie Q. Green and Madison Cawthorn. According to Roll Call, Louis Gomer and Lauren Boebert will also be sitting this one out. With me now, Glenn Kirshner, former federal prosecutor and Kurt Bardella, advisor for the DCCC. And uh, Glenn, I have to wonder if... Uh, maybe the decisions they're making might be the first sign of intelligent life that we've seen uh, in the GOP caucus. Here's Jim Jordan last week uh, fudging on whether he'd be there. Are you going to be there on September 18th? There's going to be another rally. Oh, really? So there's a big rally in D.C. for all the people that they're holding right now. And that's what they're saying. Yeah. Get in on the next. Two and likewise, Madison Cawthorn, Glenn, was last week threatening to bust those guys out, thinking or ruminating about how they could bust them out of prison. Do you think this might be a sign that they're worried about their legal situation? Yeah, you know, Joy, I think this uh, protest, this rally, whatever you, they want to call it, will probably fizzle. But if it doesn't, what I am confident of is Joe Biden's administration will make sure 
that the Capitol is protected. There will be enough federal law enforcement forces deployed to protect whatever the threat is to the Capitol as a result of this this new little protest that they're trying to gin up. Of course, it may fizzle in part because Donald Trump has lost all of his platform, so he can't gin up the kind of hateful support that he's used to ginning up. But I'll tell you, when you look at what happened on January 6th, it sure looked like the executive branch, Donald Trump's executive branch, deprived the Capitol of the forces it needed to repel the attack, the attack that was orchestrated and launched by Donald Trump himself. That stood in stark comparison to the BLM protests, which I attended, and there was every law enforcement agency known to man and some unknown to man because they weren't even wearing proper insignia. For goodness sakes, the Bureau of Prisons riot squad was there, and I've never seen that unit deployed outside a Bureau of Prisons riot. So listen, let them bring their their 700 people or however many show up. Joe Biden's administration will be well prepared. Yeah, and you know, I think it's a very good point, uh, Kurt. That uh, you know, we we all we we understand that, but for there having been January six, these seven hundred or whatever odd number of oddballs would have showed up, and there'd probably be very little in light uh, police presence. Because uh, let's just be blunt, this is not a group of black people uh, showing up, right? But, but that aside, uh, do you think that without Donald Trump tweeting the "It's going to be wild" tweets that he did uh, last December and ginning up? Uh, a, a, a basically a rally for himself and saying, come to do this to defend me, that they that they will lack these groups, that they'll lack sort of the impetus uh, to put it together and to make it to pull it off. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the optimistic view here, that without the megaphone of social media at its disposal to incite and uh, motivate people to attend, uh, that, that this will essentially be a non-event. This will just be your typical gathering of white nationalists uh, protesting the incarceration of domestic terrorists in America, because that's where we're at right now in this country. But I, I think this is also going to be an interesting and an instructive case study about what happens when you don't allow open aired f- hate speech to litter the entire social media apparatus, when you don't allow those platforms to be used as a rallying cry, as a uniting cry by these hate groups and by hateful people like Donald Trump. The reason why this may fizzle out is because Trump's not on Twitter anymore, because all these actors aren't using them as propaganda vehicles to try to get all these people to show up and and commit an act of domestic terrorism. So hopefully what we see coming up is nowhere near what we saw on January 6th. And that just tells me that removing people from these platforms works and we need to keep doing it and doing it more aggressively. Yeah. Are you, are you telling me that Getter and Parler are not hot? Is that what you're trying to basically tell me? I mean, what, very quickly to stay with you for a minute. Um, sorry. Uh, what does it tell you that these guys are now trying to operate in Brazil? I mean, it seems like they're trying to take their show on the road. Kurt. I mean, it just seems to me that people like Steve Bannon and Jason Miller, that the you know, and this has really been their you know, modus operandi for the better part of five years. If there is money to be made somewhere, if, the, if there's an opportunity to extend the grift, they're going to go there and do it. We've seen Bannon pal around with very controversial billionaire Chinese figures. We've seen now Jason Miller in Brazil. We're seeing them try to take the show on the road and do yeah. what they've done in America, which is dupe and sucker people into giving their money to these people to who then use yeah. it to enrich themselves. Glenn, I have to give you a last word here because we have seen a couple of these uh, proud boys and such uh, who are now facing, uh, they're facing the, the, the music. And can, what do you make of these these requests? You have Gabriel Garcia, who's a defendant. He's arguing that the his ankle monitor is unsafe because his potential clients can hear the beeping. So it's messing with his business. You have Dominique Pizzola. Uh, he's arguing for his relief because he says the hygiene is not good and the showers aren't good and, and everything's nicer and gen pop. <laughs> I guess he wants to go to the general population. What do you make of these uh, these whinings? So these requests are entirely ordinary. Anytime somebody is on release and a judge imposes conditions of release to make sure, one, the community is protected, and two, the defendant doesn't flee, we get these requests to modify the conditions of release. And it's a shame that the ankle monitor may be chafing the ankle of a domestic terrorist. I don't feel all that bad for him, but here's what I predict the judges will do. They'll say, 
the reason you're behaving is because you're wearing an ankle monitor. So the last thing the court is going to be inclined to do is modify the conditions, you know, in the wake of these complaints and take the ankle monitor off these characters. Not going to happen. It is Friday, the 10th of September of 2021, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Blue Moon Spirits Fridays because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life indeed. Well, uh, the weekend before a, well, fairly ominous anniversary, that of course being the 20 year anniversary of 9 11. Um, you know, I kind of oscillate back and forth between a more jovial, jocular mood and uh, one of morose understanding of, wow, is it really appropriate to be making jokes? And uh, 9-11 continues to do that for me. Um, you know, I do still remember, and do you? Do you possibly remember the actual visceral moment that feeling that you had when you realized we were being attacked, that this was a military operation. Uh, it took me, well, <laughs> right when the second building, the second tower was uh, uh, flown into. Now, the first one, I, you know, I thought, this is weird. Could be an accident. I mean, it's weird. Uh, not too long before that, uh, didn't uh, a, a New York Yankees, I believe it was a Yankees baseball player, I don't think it was a Mets, but a Yankees baseball player was in a uh, a plane, a prop plane, with an instructor and flew into a building by accident. And I, you know, that, that was fairly fresh in my mind. It didn't happen so soon before, but, it, you know, I thought, wow, that's kind of weird. But when the uh, second plane flew in, that's... When I knew that we were being attacked, it had not been yet confirmed, of course. And then when we heard about the Pentagon, well, there was no question then, was there? So I do remember that visceral moment of, well, rallying around the flag. There are no separations between us and our society politically we're all Americans and we are being attacked all of us not some of us all of us and uh, small confession I was one of the first and few who flew the flag in Berkeley California pretty much starting on 9-11 Within a month, we took it down because, well, <laughs> that was when George Bush got involved and they decided, hey, disaster, let's use it. And they did. And we got into a 20-year campaign in Afghanistan. My God. But I remember that moment. And then I also remember the moment about a month later when the disgust of what our country was doing was a little bit too much. Or at least what was being done in our name. So, I didn't bring the flag down because I hated America. But the reason that I flew the flag in the first place was no longer an issue. In fact, remember years later when Bush pretty much said oh, Osama bin Laden who okay and that was the reason we got into Afghanistan because they were training them and they gave them safe harbor and all this dally yada yada yeah <sighs> so feeling a little bit morose about that um, I think about the people that died that day in the plains, in the buildings, in a field in Pennsylvania, in the Pentagon. 
And it bothers me still. Now, my friends were late risers. Late to bed, late to rise. And I'm an early riser. Though sometimes I don't get to bed so early. I gotta tell you, eek. Anyway, I was up early. And on the West Coast, that was still fairly early. And it was a nice day. Sunny in Berkeley. In fact, a little warm for Berkeley. Low 70s. Already in the morning. (sighs) And I wanted to call my friends. But I knew they were not up. I wanted to tell them, get up, look at the TV. So I waited till about 10, 30, 11 hour time, which is a considerable amount of time to have passed for the late risers to arise and realize that the United States of America, as we knew it, was no more. And they didn't even know it yet. And they were just finding out And I always liked it when people who just find out things think that they're the first ones to find it out. (laughs) And they got to tell everybody, did you hear? Yeah, I heard. Hours ago, I wanted to call you, but you were in bed. (laughs) Yeah, well, I figured if they were going to fly something into the Trans-America building, you know, the pyramid, uh, I would probably be knocking on my friend's door and not even bother with a telephone at that point. Yep. So now the American flag has pretty much been usurped and it really bothers me. Uh, I fly it here at the uh, mothership all the time. I do because I refuse to let them take it from us. Not that I hold great credence in a piece of fabric as if it is the thing that we are, uh, well, you know, fighting for. No. We're not fighting for the fabric, but for the representation. Come on. We're intelligent beings. But the, dare I say, the fascists, you know, I call them Nazis because that rolls off the tongue. But, you know, they're they're really technically more fascists. When they drive around in their giant monster trucks. Oh, I'm so economically anxietied. Yeah, no shit. Look at that monstrosity that you got to pay for. I'm sure you didn't. I'm sure you don't own it outright. Stupid idiot. Then they start whining to us about, you just don't know how to live in their means. Those black people are taking money from me so I can have my monster truck. Oh, shut up. Scaflaw. Deadbeat. A lot of them are. But, uh, you know, they drive around and they got the big Trump flag and the big American flag. And sometimes the American flag has been defaced. You know, being some sort of monochromo black and gray. What's up with that? Well, there's a red or blue line down one of the stripes. What's up with that? And I will remind those folks on the right. That when you're wearing flag pants, you're sitting on the United States of America, you terrible, unfeeling, uncaring person. All right. Well, it has been decades in the making that those of us who took the great experiment seriously to the point that we, well, thought that public education was a right and a duty because an informed electorate is a informed electorate. They can take part in their democracy and elect whom they would like to have represent them. They would know how to read a law because laws are codified documents and sometimes it takes a bit of a talent to understand them. Critical thinking is required in these situations. But if you are of an authoritarian bent, that is the last thing you want. An informed public (laughs) that that will figure out what the hell we're doing and might rise up, however that is. 
Yeah. I used to feel safe in the knowledge that it didn't matter that all these gun nuts were getting their guns because they thought they were going to take over the gun or the government was going to come and take their guns away. And it was so stupid because, you know, the force of the United States of America is a lot more powerful than their pea shooter, no no matter how ridiculously large that pea shooter might be. It didn't occur to me that those very same people would be trying to take over the government, not necessarily at the government, but at the electorate level, at the school board level, at the point of, well, the KKK rides again and they come to your house on Harley Davidson's 5,000 strong, just to let you know who's boss, Hog, <laughs> boss Hog. This is where we are. Intimidation. And we have a whole state now, Texas, who have essentially deputized any citizen who decides that they'd like to, well, let out their misogyny on a woman who's wronged them. Or women in general because a woman has wronged them. Mom might have spanked them when they didn't want to be spanked. Sometimes they liked being spanked. Sometimes they didn't, but they're going to take it out on mom. And every woman out there is mom. All right. We're just supposed to take it. Thankfully, Mary Garland and the DOJ is on it. Now, I will say that maybe he speaks softly and carries a big stick. I just wish that, you know, he would sort of like smack the stick a few more times quietly. But, you know, he needs to smack a few people. All right. Well, oh, my. Look at the time. Why don't we go ahead and get into the curated part of the show? Because that's what we do here. And it's Friday. We could just keep going on and on and on, but we won't. Well, starting at the top there, uh, the Biden administration will make sure the Capitol is protected at that insurrection to point O rally on the 18th of this month coming up. Then on the rest of the menu, the U.S. is doubling the fine for people who break the rule requiring masks on planes, trains, and other forms of public transit. Keep wearing your mask. Game is not over. It's not. After a request by the city, the Justice Department will review the police force in Columbus, Ohio. The city requested it. And the House Select Committee on January 6th has received thousands of documents before Thursday's deadline for U.S. companies and government agencies to submit them. And we're going to find out a few things about that. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where a top human rights lawyer has fled Russia after accusing officials of a purge of people they see as undesirable. And the small right-wing People's Party of Canada expelled one of its local officials for throwing gravel at Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Radio.com to the right of the page is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the left of that chat room link across the page at the bottom of our homepage at netroosradio.com is the link to our Patreon page. And please, yes, do become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio. It really helps us pay our bills. If you could afford an espresso-type coffee drink, and if you could afford to send those funds our way, 
we are able to stretch those dollars with the funds that we have on hand out of our own wallets, to be specific. And uh, we stretch all of those dollars beyond compare. We pay our bills. We fly under the radar and continue this powerhouse of resistance against, well, foreign and domestic powers arrayed against the United States of America. And we thank you for your generosity in allowing us to fulfill our civic duty. Uh, We take it quite seriously, though we kind of joke around about everything anyway. But seriously, thank you for your generosity. The bills do keep going up. (laughs) Just keep going going up. Thank you for your generosity once again. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, you can do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Thank you, Tom. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. Get that linked up on Twitter and other social media platforms. You know who they are. The show notes and links, uh, that's where the real reportage is linked to, so check it out, please. (laughs) Also, you can follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West, and most importantly, would you please pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and really wherever podcasts can be found. Um, Yeah. We need, uh, for some reason, whoever named this show West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy didn't take into account that W's are way down on the list. I guess that person, me, could have named it uh, A West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, but no, no, not even the. (laughs) It's straight on W West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Anyway, do pick up podcasts, review them. You know, I mean, do something. I, I Hopefully you like it and uh, it'll push it up in the search engine because there's millions, billions, trillions of podcasts out there. And, uh, well, <laughs> is it really that important in the bigger scheme of things, considering how immense the universe is and time when compared to this little snippet? You know, a lot faster than even the shutter and a camera. Remember the shutters and cameras? They made that little whir and click. I used to think how fast that was. Now it's all digitized. Different. All right. Enough of uh, metaphysics on a Friday, especially without uh, enough coffee. And we are not dipping into the French 77 so early, at least not on the West Coast. But uh, uh, we may later on before the weekend's up. Ben Fox of the Associated Press brings us this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Oh, and it is Blue Moon Spirits Fridays because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life. The U.S. is doubling the fine for people who break the rule requiring masks on planes, trains, and other forms of public transit to slow the spread of COVID-19 with President Joe Biden warning that violators should be prepared to pay. First-time offenders would face a potential fine of 500 to 1,000 bucks, and second-time offenders could pay 1,000 to 3,000 dollars under rules that the Transportation Secretary Administration said will go uh, transportation security administration said will go into effect today friday the fine currently starts at $250 and, and can go up to $1500 for repeat offenders if you break the rules be prepared to pay Biden said as he announced the increase during a speech outlining sweeping new federal vaccine requirements as part of an effort to increase COVID-19 vaccinations and curb the surging Delta variant. And the president also rebuked people who have been taking out their anger about the mask requirement on flight crews. Well, I would say even in Trader Joe's. Come on. Uh, And by the way, show some more respect, he said. The anger you see on television toward flight attendants and others doing their job is wrong. It's ugly. 
The mask penalties are separate from any civil penalties the Federal Aviation Administration may issue for unruly behavior. The mask mandate has been controversial and has led to many tense encounters between passengers who don't want to wear a mask and flight attendants asked to enforce the rule. The FAA said last month that airlines had reported 3,889 incidents involving unruly passengers just this year and 2,867, or 74%, involved refusing to wear a mask. The rule requiring masks on planes and all public transit will remain in effect until at least January 18th, the Department of Homeland Security said. Farnoosh Amiri of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The U.S. Justice Department will review practices of the Columbus Police Department after a series of fatal police shootings of black people and its response to last year's racial injustice protests, the city and the government announced yesterday, Thursday. The review will be conducted by the Justice Department's Office of Community-Oriented Policing Services and will consist of what the department is calling technical assistance in such areas as training, recruitment, including a focus on diversity, technology, and creating an early intervention system for officers. This is not about one particular officer, policy, or incident. Columbus Mayor Andrew Ginter said in a statement, rather, this is about reforming the entire institution of policing in Columbus. Unlike other cities under Justice Department review, which is often unwanted, Columbus requested the federal involvement. Ginter and city attorney Zach Klein asked the government to intervene in April, days after a white officer fatally shot 16-year-old Makia Bryant, while the teenager who was black was swinging a knife at a woman. The cop's office has a track record of providing an array of resources for policy departments, said Robert Chapman, acting cop's director. Reinforcing the key tenets of community policing partnerships, the use of problem solving to address crime systematically, and transforming both organizations and their people will result not only in more effective law enforcement, but also in communities that are safer and stronger, he said in a statement. Ginter and the All-Democratic City Council pushed for multiple changes to the Columbus Division of Police over the years, including the creation, approved by voters in November, of the city's first civilian police review board and the selection in June of Elaine Bryant as police chief the first black woman to serve in that role. But Ginter said in April, when he requested a Justice Department review, that the city needs additional help because of fierce opposition to reform within the agency. Well, you you would expect that, wouldn't you? You got these police unions, and I got to tell you, they have a fairly right-wing bent. Yeah, almost like Burgermeister type right-wing bent, if you get my drift. We need to purge the Nazis from law enforcement, please. Criticism has included not just fatal police shootings, but also the department's reaction to protests over racial injustice and police brutality following the death of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. A report commissioned by the Columbus City Council and released in April, criticized both the police department and city leaders, saying Columbus 
was unprepared for the size and energy of the protests. Thursday's announcement was criticized almost immediately by some advocates for deeper reform within the agency. Ginter should have requested a review known as a pattern and practices investigation, which would carry with it the possibility of court-ordered oversight, said Sean Walton, an attorney who has represented the families of several black people fatally shot by Columbus police. Accepting a review by the community policing office was an intentional attempt to ignore the Columbus Department's abusive history in an effort to avoid a negative national spotlight coming to Columbus, said Walton, speaking on behalf of the Columbus Police Accountability Project. He called Ginter's decision a slap in the face to the people he claims to serve, and yet is another frustrating example of politics as usual in Columbus. Patricia's and Gurley of Reuters brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. A congressional committee investigating the deadly January 6th assault on the U.S. Capitol received thousands of documents before yesterday's deadline, Thursday of course, for U.S. companies and government agencies to submit them, a committee spokesperson said. The National Archives, which handles presidential records, has also begun a pre-release review of documents tied to former Republican President Trump's White House that were part of the committee's document request. The Democratic-led House of Representatives Select Committee last month announced extensive requests for materials related to the Capitol attack, including communication records from Trump's White House with a submission deadline of September 9th. That was yesterday. With several hours to go before the deadline, the Select Committee received thousands of pages of documents in response to our first set of requests and our investigative team is actively engaged to keep that flow of information going, the spokesperson said in an email statement. The panel asked for White House records held by the National Archives and Records Administration, as well as material from the Departments of Defense, Homeland Security, Interior and Justice, and the FBI, National Counterterrorism Center, and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. The panel also asked major social media companies, including Facebook, Twitter, and Alphabet Inc., which is Google, to turn over records of messages related to the assault on the Capitol by Trump's supporters. Details of what was turned over were not available late last night. A source familiar with the matter said material came from both companies and government entities. Republican Representative Kevin McCarthy, well, that's a nice way of calling him an insurgent. The House Minority Leader, also known as an insurgent, threatened companies that complied with the company's request, saying Republicans would not forget. Handing over the information violates federal law, McCarthy said, although it was not clear what law he was referring to, because there is no such law. And you would expect Reuters to mention that, but they don't. The committee's request included records connected to the violence and the days leading up to it, including the spread of misinformation and efforts to stop the certification of President Joe Biden's election. 
Well, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. This week, a sweet reboot. Calling Nina DaCosta's Candyman a remake is a bit of a misnomer. Instead, the movie takes plot threads from the 1992 original and uses them in a contemporary story. The setting is the same, Chicago's Cabrini Green, but as in real life, the infamous projects are gone and the area is now gentrified. However, remnants of the earlier time remain, including William, a business owner whose chance encounter with protagonist Anthony sets the plot in motion. Anthony, a successful artist living in Cabrini with his girlfriend Brianna, first hears about the legend of Candyman from Brianna's brother. For those who don't know, Candyman is the spirit of a black man who was murdered in real life and takes his rage out on those who summon him. Say his name five times in front of a mirror and he appears, complete with hook in place of a missing hand. William reveals that he actually knew the real-life Candyman. His name was Sherman and he was falsely accused of giving kids candy containing razor blades in the 70s. William was also present when Sherman was beaten to death by police. If this sounds different from the original, it is. This one combines that story and that of Sherman's. Anthony becomes obsessed with the legend, even designing an art exhibit complete with a mirror and a sign urging viewers to say his name. Sufficient to say, some people do. While some may accuse the film of being political, we're reminded that the original Candyman was a 19th century African-American artist who was lynched for having a relationship with a white woman. DaCosta's take is fresh, chilling, and relevant. Candyman may be scary, but even scarier is its portrayal of the cops. The projects may be gone, but certain attitudes remain. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Mark Stratton. It was lights out and the babies were up again. Ahana Fernandez of the Natural History Museum Berlin pointed her microphone at the day roost. She was trying to catch these bat pops in full babble mode. Now normally... When we think of babbling babies, we're talking human newborns. But Fernandez was in the forest to prove something surprising, that these bat babies babble in many of the same ways humans do, despite a wide evolutionary gap between us and them. Babbling is a production milestone in human-infant speech development, and it is characterized by universal features. However, evidence for babbling in non-human mammals is scarce, rendering cross-species comparisons difficult. We investigated a pup babbling behavior of wild Sacopteryx bilinata, a bat capable of vocal imitation, to compare its features to those that characterize human infant babbling. The findings are published in the journal Science magazine. The sack winged bat is known to be particularly loquacious, with a repertoire of 25 different syllable types. Fernandez has been studying the species for six years. In previous work on their language, she and her colleagues noticed that sometimes mothers spoke in a kind of pattern meant to get a response from their pups. She calls it motherese, basically a kind of baby talk aimed at their pups to guide them towards adult bat language. If you've ever been in front of a four-month-old, you yourself have probably uttered or heard someone speak in baby talk. Bat mothers, it turns out, do the same. Fernandez showed that these female sackwing bats heighten the pitch of their tombe and slow down their tempo to enable the pups to engage. In his current research, after studying 20 of these babbling babies in Costa Rica and Panama, 
the researchers identified eight speech precursors, or protophones, in the pup's babbling, each share a parallel to that of human infants. One, baby bat babbling starts early in life. Two, bouts of babbling contain combinations of adult-like sounds mixed with total gibberish. Three, bat babies learn a smaller set of sounds that are universal to adult bat speak. Four, eventually, adult bat words. Our syllables emerge from the babble. Five, the babies repeat the heck out of those adult bat sounds. Think of a human baby saying ba ba ba, ga ga ga, over and over again. Six, these repeated syllable trains get a rhythm, so bat babies speak to a beat. Seven, babies will happily talk to themselves. It only takes one for conversation in bat babble. And eight. Different colonies of babbling baby bats in Panama and Costa Rica, male and female, all babbled the same way. A long list of specifics, to be sure, but says Fernandez, the fact that they are all there is really interesting, and not just for understanding bat speak. Human language is a very complex system requiring different cognitive abilities. For example, the ability of vocal imitation. By investigating if and to what extent those abilities evolved in other species helps us to better understand the biological foundations of human language. In our case, pup babbling indicates us when vocal learning is taking place. This allows us to pinpoint the exact time window in the brain when learning processes are ongoing, enabling us to study the neuromolecular foundations of vocal imitation. And just like in humans, clear communication can make or break a bat's future. The research team found the first ten syllables the pups acquired were present in the complex songs that adult males used to stake their territory, all to ensure the birth of more babbling babies. The research, she says, opens the door to a better understanding of the dynamic relationship of parents and children in humans. Even though humans and bats are phylogenetically so different, they use a strikingly similar behavior to reach the same goal. Acquiring a large and complex vocal repertoire, both use babbling to master the control of their vocal apparatus, enabling them to produce complex sounds and vocalizations. Studying more different babbling species, both vocal learners and non-vocal learners, will help us understand which evolutionary pressures cause babbling to be present in some species and not in others. Regardless of what other corners we may yet find babbling babies, we now know that human and bat parents share something in common. They must both rear loud, gibbering young, often in the dead of night. Thanks for listening to Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Mark Stratton. I'm probably okay to have one more drink before I drive home. I'm probably okay. I open the window to stay alert. Probably okay. I just popped some gum in my mouth. Step out of the car, please. I probably made a mistake. Probably okay isn't okay when it comes to drinking and driving. If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetRootsRadio.com. Show your progressive side and go to the donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our donate button at the bottom of netrootsradio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 2012. That was the day the Chicago Teachers Union walked off the job for the first time in 25 years. The historic week-long strike resonated nationwide among trade unionists and served to reinvigorate the labor movement. Certainly higher wages and better benefits were among the teachers' demands. The city's mayor, Rahm Emanuel, had canceled the union's wage increase, laid off close to a thousand teachers, and went on the attack against seniority rights and working conditions. The strike enjoyed wide 
wide public support among parents and the public. Teachers emphasized broader educational problems they faced, namely the attacks fueled by corporate privatization. They wanted a return to more traditional forms of education rather than simply preparing students for endless rounds of testing. They wanted more art, music, and gym classes and they demanded stable funding for social support services for the most vulnerable at-risk students. Union teachers understood that the Board of Education was using standardized testing to get rid of teachers and schools in order to privatize education, all in the name of turning around failing schools and helping the kids. Though the contract was less than perfect, it showed the power working people have to hold the line against continued assaults on their standards of living, especially in the public sector. The CTU was able to beat back attempts at merit pay and increased use of student test scores in teacher evaluations. They won first-time recall rights, supply reimbursements, and liberal arts classes. There were concessions, however, made on seniority rights, pay for laid-off teachers, and longer work days. But the CTU demonstrated that strikes can win in a period of extended anti-union onslaughts. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River. In the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 63 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting to be much, much cooler than yesterday. Uh, we're expecting only a high in the mid-70s with a mix of clouds and sun. A stray uh, shower or thunderstorm is possible with winds light and variable. We did have a tad of rain last night, though it doesn't look like we had the the uh, deluge that we had expected here or been forecast for here. But I did uh, find out that considerable amounts of rain did fall uh, various parts of the West Coast, uh, the Bay Area included, and they need it. Mostly clear tonight with lows in the mid-50s, winds light and variable, partly cloudy skies tomorrow. Highs inching back up into the mid-80s, winds out of the north, northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County in the southern part of Oregon continue to spike, have now increased precipitously to 197,081 people infected. And our deceased have increased by another six and now stand at 230. Pollen is rated as none right outside the window here in Rogue River proper. The air quality index is moderate in the low range of moderate at 96 parts per million. And the daytime UV index is high at a fall measure of six. Barometric pressure is falling at 29.96 inches. Oh, I'm sorry. I read that wrong. Barometric pressure is rising at 29.96 inches, visibility is at 6 miles, and relative humidity is at 93%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world, and we call that the Weather Underground. London is 69 and mostly cloudy. Paris is 73 and mostly cloudy. Rome is 80 degrees and sunny. Oh, Rome. Kiev is 76 and fair. Kabul is 71 and clear. It's hard to give up after 20 years, I know. Hong Kong is 81 and fair. Tokyo is 75 and mostly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 60 degrees and fair. San Francisco, California is 57 degrees and cloudy. And New York, New York is 70 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny. 
And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd crowdsources from around the world. David Chikabashibli of Reuters brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. A top human rights lawyer who defended jailed Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny's team and announced this week he had fled Russia, accused authorities yesterday Thursday of mounting a campaign to purge the political landscape of people they see as undesirable. Defense lawyer Ivan Pavlov, age 50, gained prominence for taking on politically sensitive cases and defending people charged with treason or espionage by the Federal Security Service, the successor to the Soviet KGB. We know him as the FSB. He said on Tuesday that he had left for neighboring Georgia, saying his work had become impossible due to a criminal case against him, and uh, a set of restrictions placed on him and state pressure on the legal outfit he founded. He is one of an array of people to flee during a crackdown on supporters of Navalny, a fierce critic of Vladimir Putin, and on media outlets seen by authorities as hostile and foreign back to head of the September 17th, 19th parliamentary elections. Among those to emigrate this year are most of Navalny's closest allies, whose network was banned as extremist in July. Journalists for media outlets declared as foreign agents or banned as undesirable. And several anti-government activists. The Kremlin denies its opponents or critical media outlets are targeted for political reasons and says any criminal action against individuals is the result of them breaking the law. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Steve Scherer of Reuters brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays as if you didn't know the small right-wing People's Party of Canada, known as the PPC, expelled one of its local officials yesterday, Thursday, after over allegations he threw gravel at Liberal Prime Minister Justin Trudeau earlier this week. Trudeau was hit by a handful of gravel on Monday, television images showed, while campaigning in London, Ontario, ahead of the September 20th election. He was making his way back to his campaign bus uh, to, past a crowd shouting their opposition to COVID-19 vac- vaccinations. London police said they were investigating but have not announced any charges. PPC spokesman Marty Mass or Martin Mass confirmed in an email that Shane Marshall had been removed as president of the PPC's Elgin Middlesex London constituency association. Mass gave no further details and Marshall could not immediately be reached for comment. People's Party leader Maxime Bernier, a former 
former Minister of Foreign Affairs and Industry, founded the populist PPC in 2018 after narrowly losing his bid for the leadership of the main opposition Conservative Party. In 2019, the PPC won only 1.6% of the national vote and failed to get a seat in Parliament, but an Eco's poll this week has the PPC at 9%. Bernier, who calls himself a limited government conservative, has been drawing vocal crowds as he campaigns against pandemic lockdowns and vaccine mandates. That's what they do. All right, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day and the week. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we're going to meet up on Monday for River City Hash Mondays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day, all night, and all weekend for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here on Monday, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des tiers, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver